Platoon Part 2 is dropped in theaters. You've had a couple of days to watch it, so let's talk spoilers. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your spoiler-packed thoughts on Dune Part 2. No need for a spoiler warning if you're talking about Dune Part 1 or 2, but if you want to talk about future things in the books that have not happened in the movies yet, please put a warning about that. But as for the movie itself, the events happen there. People were warned by the title of the video as well as the thumbnail. If you haven't seen Dune Part 2 yet, Go watch the movie, it's great. Then come back and join the discussion over here. One more thing before we get started, today's video is brought to you by Audible. If you're like me and you like to read with your ears, not your eyes, Audible is a great solution. I've been a massive fan of Audible ever since summer of 2015, so almost nine years now. And you can get a free audiobook of your choice as well as a 30-day free trial of Audible at audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. They do have Dune as well as the rest of the Dune books, so you can dive further into this world and explore that is actually something I'm very much planning on doing over the next few weeks. I have not read the book yet, but I do plan on listening to it very shortly. That's audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler for a free audiobook of your choice as well as a free 30-day trial of Audible. And with that said, let's get started with our spoiler review. These are kind of, it's thematically broken down. I'll have chapter markers down below if you want to skip over to a specific subject, plot point, discussion, all that fun stuff. And let's get started. First topic of the day, what are my thoughts on the movie after a second viewing? So I'd only seen it once when I did my spoiler free review. I saw it at a press screening almost a couple weeks back. And for some reason they did the Austin press screening at like a really small kind of theater. It's more like a screening room than a full massive theater, which I thought was a very odd choice. It's a good theater, but not for a movie like Dune Part 2. So I went to go see it a second time. I didn't see it in IMAX, but I did see it in XD. And so it doesn't necessarily have the dimensions of IMAX, but I think the XD theater here in Austin is better than the LIMAX theaters here in Austin. And there's only one true IMAX theater and I wasn't able to get to that theater to watch it. So watched it, true, massive screen, awesome sound the second time and pretty much solidified everything that I said in my spoiler-free review. I thought it was great, fantastic. There were a couple things that I wasn't so crazy about, but, um, you know, dive into the specifics of that in this video, but it's basically a lock to be in my top three movies of the year. Wouldn't be terribly surprised if it was my number one movie of the year, and I wouldn't be, like, disappointed. This is a fantastic film, a great piece of cinema, something that got me excited about the movies, and then also got me excited about the subject matter, even a way that the first Dune didn't do. This one made me want to do the deep dive further into all of it. And like, I want to go tell people to go check it out. I, I can't wait for my wife to be able to go see it so we could talk about it. Those are the movies that excite me. Those are the ones that I like to have in my top 10. But I wasn't surprised that I, that I loved the film. I mean, it was one of my most anticipated movies for quite a while now. I was very happy how much more excited I am for the world of Dune coming out of this one than after the first film, which I also really, really liked. And one of the things about this movie that just kind of stuck with me is that, like, there's just not a single frame in the movie that feels false. Every frame of the movie feels believable and real. And there's some wacky, wild stuff that happens in the film, and all of it rings true. All of the choices, performances, effects, sets, costumes, all of it rings true true to a level where you just look at it and you go, it, it's incredible what we're able to do these days, which also, as I mentioned, my spoiler free review puts a really bad light on a lot of movies that just cost more and look much worse than this film. But like even like right now, I'm doing kind of this deep dive into the world of Dune. So I watched the 84 film. I'm currently watching the 2000 miniseries and they have the same story, but dramatically different experiences because of just how immersive it is when you're able to just capture the images in such a true fashion. Other thing that kind of comes to mind with my experience with Dune, I, I alluded to this just a minute ago, but my experience watching Dune 
kind of is similar to my experience watching Game of Thrones in that both of them, I could respect a lot of things about them whenever I first experienced them, but also they're very dense. They're not the easiest, most accessible things where the hook and the appeal isn't dangling there right in front of you at the start. And so it can take a long time to really get up to speed fully on the, the what's really going on with the plot, who all the characters are, what all their motivations are, because there's so many different things. And on first viewing, you could follow along well enough with the plot, but you miss a lot of the deeper meaning on that first viewing. And the further you go in, the more you understand, the more you want to watch. And you also immediately want to go back and start over to see what you missed and all the details about how these competing factions tie together. And it makes for kind of this addictive feeling of relating to the material of you want to just kind of keep going back to it to dig deeper to see all of the little things and how they tie together in a meaningful way. Like after part one, I was like, oh, that was a cool, great film. But I wasn't like, oh man, I'm gonna jump onto the internet and watch a bunch of explainer videos. I finished part two, and that's like all I wanted to do, like dive into all the details and what what did I miss and what's the differences between the movie and the book and how does this tidy, what was kind of going on with this? I didn't do any of that after the first movie. That's like all I wanted to do the last week. And as I mentioned before, I'm you know part of my deep dive is like, oh like, how was this translated in 1984 by David Lynch? How did they do it on sci-fi for the miniseries? What are the comparisons? What are the differences? All of that fun stuff. And so it, it's just like it's as someone that talks movies too much, as someone that loves movies and lore, when you discover something that like gets you excited about the world and you just want to figure it all out, that's cool. And that's what this movie was able to do. And even, like I said, after the second viewing, more so feel myself getting more excited about parts of it and wanting to dive into all of it. So let's talk about Paul Atreides, hero or villain subversion done right. So in Dune, Paul is our protagonist. He is the, the chosen one who at the beginning of our story is a reluctant hero. His family is horribly wronged by oppressive, violent forces that betray them, attack them, viciously try to wipe them out. And Paul, our reluctant hero, slowly starts to become part of this prophecy of the Fremen, rises up as the powerful leader that's able to fight back against the oppressors, free the Fremen from the op Harkonnens who have dominated them and tried to wipe them out for decades. And he's able to rise to power and conquer evil. That is a true statement of what happens in Dune. But, and that's a version that ties very much into the hero's journey. That is this mono myth that Joseph Campbell started to articulate well, now I guess about 70 years back that is the basis of so much of the storytelling recently. It has always kind of been a basis of storytelling that these mythological figures that were drawn to, these messiah figures that were drawn towards, and then it's become something intentional that storytellers of the last 40-ish years have tried to capture in film. And there's a version of this where Paul hits most of these beats as uh, he rises up to be the chosen one to free the people and conquer evil. However, <laughs> that is not really exactly what's going on here. As very early on, it, it's made clear that we've got these Bene Gesserit sisterhood that are scheming and conspiring for their own purposes and plans. And Paul is one of many potential candidates to be the fulfillment of everything that they are trying to do, all of their manipulations that they're trying to work out here. And as part of all of this, their scheming and manipulations, they've put these prophecies out there. They're not prophecies. They're saying, this is a thing that we're trying to do. There's a thing they're trying to do and they're spreading it out to people. And thus Paul is a part of this. And as Paul's motivation is, is revenge against the people that harmed him and his family, he, he's not really a believer in the Fremen prophecies because he knows enough of the 
the manipulations have gone on here. He's certainly not behind what it, what his mother's up to. And he chooses to eventually use all of this for his own purposes. And so that's what makes it so fascinating is that it's the story is happening on several different levels. It is true that he's fulfilling the prophecies for these people over here, but the reason that that's happening is not nearly simple. And it works as Paul has the journey that he's on, but there's also the built-in dread and terror based on his premonitions of where this is headed. And he's aware that if he plays this all out, it goes very badly. There's a negative side to all of this. And that's where you're doing subversion correctly. Subversion in movies has been one that um, has been a, a word frequently used as a negative in describing films where to a lot of people, The Last Jedi was very subversive in that we have Rey hand Luke Skywalker his, his lightsaber and you expect him to go, oh, thanks. Or whatever he would do, like have the sentimental moment. What they subvert your expectations and he tosses it over his shoulder. Very unexpected, not what you're thinking is going to happen, but also to many people feels like, ooh, that's not right. Mm, I don't like that at all. And then there's all sorts of things in The Last Jedi that they set up all of these types of tropes in a Star Wars movie, and then it turns it on its head. Like, is she important? No, she's not. Uh, Snoke's the big, bad, evil mastermind? No, he's not. And there's all these ways in which it, it subverts expectations in a way that for a lot of us, some of you loved it. Some of you, fair enough. But to a lot of us, we went, oh, that just felt hollow and empty. That was unexpected, but it wasn't satisfying. You're not delivering the experience that I want from a Star Wars movie. And in fact, it feels like you're almost insulting me for wanting Star Wars things in a Star Wars movie. That's the way many of us felt about Last Jedi. And what I would say Dune, specifically part two, is able to do is that you do get the payoff moments of this classic hero's journey. But there's so much more underneath it that makes it for a richer experience, an unexpected way for all of this to play out to where you can have the music swell as he rises to power and it's like, yeah, let's go get the Harkonnens. Let's go free the planet. And there's a truth to that. It's not just a hollow emotion. But at the same time, there's a, a, always that second emotion, that other, there's not even just a second layer, there's third, fourth layers to everything kind of going on to where it's unexpected, it's more layered and complex, and therefore a more emotionally interesting. That's what subversion done right is supposed to be like, where you're able to deliver something even better to the audience than they expected. You're not, you're, it's not just that you don't want to spoon feed them and do something just cliche, obvious, fit the formula. But you don't want to do so different that you're not delivering what your genre is supposed to deliver, something even in the ballpark. Like you want to find that great spot where you feel like the writer, the storytellers, the filmmakers are smarter than me as the audience member and are able to deliver something I didn't even know that I wanted that's satisfying, but also which makes that it fits in the genre that we're watching. That's what I would say that Dune is able to do with... Um, Paul Atreides with this grander lore of everything kind of going on. Let's talk about the Bene Gesserit and who can you trust? So one of the observations my wife had in our conversations processing through the world of Dune, and she has read the book where I have not read the book. She's talking about how, the, how in this world, both our world as well as theirs, you don't know who you can trust. That just so many people have these their own motives and view everyone else as a pawn in their scheme and their schemes that you don't know who you can trust. And probably the, maybe the ultimate example of this would be the, the Bene Gesserit where they're legitimately this secretive group of <laughs> witches that are going out and having babies with all of these families in an attempt to control the universe for their purposes. So, their their wives, their concubines, their mothers, but all while n their first loyalty not being to family, not being to lovers, but being to exclusively themselves. And it's one of those things that when you first start watching it, the first movie, you're like, ah, 
Paul's mom, Lady Jessica, kind of a, it's kind of weird choices. You start to realize as you go along, oh, that's just this world. <laughs> you watch the first movie and like, what's going on with she has had her son go and put a hand in the box and maybe could have like what? Why is she doing this? Oh, but her first priority isn't to her son. <laughs> to this greater cause, and her son is just a piece in that. Her son is like their the experiment. <laughs> the their little her part of the story is providing children to the cause. Like, oh, okay, and but it just makes for this world that's really wild and crazy, and becomes real obvious when you start getting into um the the all the reveals that take place in the second film where the emperor's daughter, she's a part of this. So from the most powerful guy, daughter right there as one more person manipulating him to be a part of all this stuff. And then we find out that our hero, Paul Atreides, old grandpa is a Harkonnen. So he, and not even Lady Jessica knew all of it. She didn't even know who her father was and that part of all the manipulations and scheming was how can we find a way to like have this person that's tied to all the families, plus has all these like the mixing of bloodlines to create the the perfect chosen one for their purposes. And so you like you're not loyal to your grandpa, you're not loyal to cousin, your mom's manipulating you. She raises you. You're kind of protecting mom. You don't want mom to die, but mom doesn't seem to really concerned if you die. And that's just a fascinating world. And once again, drawing back to that Game of Thrones comparison of like, you, anyone can die, anyone can be threatened, anything can happen in this wild, wild world that is Game of Thrones, same as Dune, we're just in space and there's a lot more sand everywhere. But you, you look at it and you think, almost no one is trustworthy in, in this film, except for like Paul's father figures and father. Leto seems to be noble, doesn't, he's just trying to raise a good son, seems to want to treat people right. Like, he's, he's he's trying to do well by people in an honorable fashion. Gurney, motives seem to be pretty clear, that he's he's loyal to the Atreides. He feels, yeah, well, he was um, greatly harmed by the Harkonnens, thus wants his revenge, and sees Paul, he's so excited to see him, signs right up for that adventure that Paul is on, that can help him on his motive to get revenge. Uh, Stilgar, another person, living consistent with his beliefs among these tribes people and trusting this outsider to this, like, pretty, like, it's right there on the table what he's about. And then all these other people, it starts getting way wackier. You can't, whether you're talking about violent Harkonnens who you can't trust even being in their presence because they're just so volatile and violent that... If you don't tell them exactly what they want to hear, you just might die. Or, of course, the Bene Gesset, as we've been talking about, they are in it for themselves. You are just a pawn to them. And so a world where even Paul, who is manipulating people, feels noble by comparison because what he's doing does have benefits for the Fremen <laughs> that are being hunted by the Harkonnens. Like, let's okay, let's give you the planet back. Like, he's manipulating them. He's using them, but he's also giving them victories and things that they want in in this immediate context. And so that he can feel like the hero, while not having necessarily the fullest of heroic motives, because so many other people are so much worse <laughs> than he is. Let's talk about Stilgar, the faithful or the reaction video of characters in this film. And one of the things that the, the movie's able to do really well, in the way that it's able to have kind of these competing narratives with different interpretations, is that we're, we're seeing Paul through the eyes of different characters, of how do all these different people respond to him? And as well as do they believe in him, friends with him, um, and... So you th like Gurney is true to Atreides, so he believes in Paul as the son of Leto. So, of course, I'm behind you, believe in you. I think you're good. Like, you're the guy. I follow you now. And then, of course, you, you have other people who are more skeptical all along the way. And then you have Stilgar, who kind of gives him this chance early on and is a believer in the prophecies. And he sees the signs that have been said. 
and there's all these little moments that they're used for like comedy. They're they're used to evoke big emotions. And it's the, the way that we're able to feel the heroicness of this is because of we're seeing the reaction of Stilgar and the beliefs of Stilgar that he's been waiting for this person for all this time and it's finally here. Like, Paul said, I'm, I'm not the chosen one. This is just a trick that we saw before. You know, that's This is not, I, I'm not who you're, I just want to help you guys. I can teach you the ways, but I'm not looking to lead you. Oh, that's what he would say. He would be humble. That's what the prophet would do. And you, you, you're able to feel the, this group of people and their belief through him. When you have these moments where Paul stands on the largest worm ever, and you just see the belief in their eyes, in specifically Stilgar's eyes, their subject evokes these big emotions because of that, even while we know as the audience, this is not all good. <laughs> this is a, there's problems with what's taking place here, but you still are excited for these people that are getting their chosen one and the fulfillment. And you through the look on his face in all of these sequences, these little moments where wherever Paul does a thing, and then we see Stilgar's reaction. And that's so much of what gives the film the emotion that it has. And of course, there's, there's other people along the way. Um, uh, I'm blanking at the moment on Zendaya, her character, the friend that is an extreme doubter at the beginning. And then as she sees these signs, slowly gets converted over. And just, it's like a, it's an, a, an arc that is really impactful. The character is there to show the skill still go, are always believed. But then there's these other tribes from this the other half of the, the, the planet that don't believe in these prophecies. And you watch her as she switches sides, switches to being a believer. It doesn't have to overstate it. You just have to make jokes. Then you see her impressed. Then you see her as a believer and that have that transition. But those reactions are so much of what makes this movie work. And even as you, you move into um, the finale and we're standing in throne rooms, the way everyone else reacts, how these Benny Jesuit manipulators, as they think that they, they're still trying to control Paul and tell him what to do. And then they realize, oh, crap, <laughs> this guy's the real deal. What have we done? What has happened here? And... Their reaction communicates so much of how the, where the, the oomph of the film comes. Their reaction combined with Hans Zimmer's score, like, drives so much of this film. Another big one people are talking about, Austin Butler as Fade Routham, one of our Harkonnens, or one of our main villain Harkonnens in this film. And the, I think so much of what makes this performance fun is that this is the guy that really broke through, became super famous as Elvis. That's a vibe. <laughs> and uh, especially when all these interviews he was talking about, I'm having trouble breaking the Elvis voice, and I was kind of stuck in Elvis mode for a while there. And then his next, well, I guess he had the he has the uh, Masters of Air Show too, but the one that really is getting people talking again on mass scale, he goes from Elvis to this psycho that looks totally different. And whenever you can, you know, shave your head, paint yourself white and take away your eyebrows, like you immediately it, have that transformative experience because of the physical look is different to where it, it breaks. You know, we just, we're not seeing the same face. We're seeing something so different that we're able to easier see that it, they're transition to two different characters. But then beyond that, the way he walks the way his face moves, the glares, the grins, everything about it transforms him into this, this creep psycho that is stone cold, but also has this strange sense of honor. Maybe not strange sense of honor, but there's a truth to his, the way that he values combat, uh, other fighters and things like that. To where if he's in a fight and realizes that, uh-oh, I have to really fight this guy. And when we're on the when he's in the Coliseum, two of them are drugged, the third one is not drugged, 
And so he has to fight this guy that is actually of mind. And he chooses to turn his shield off and like, I'm going to fight this guy for real. The guy puts up a good fight, but our Harkonnen wins, kills the guy. And, and, and pausing, like it's not, he doesn't have a gloating final line. He's like, you fought with honor, like respects what this guy just did. And likewise, when he loses, he has the same reaction to defeating an Atreides and losing to an Atreides. Because both put up a good fight. Both put up an honorable fight. So, cool. And then on the other scenes, he's slitting people's throats for no reason at all other than to test a knife and give food to his cannibals or whatever was going on with that. And there's something about that that is uh, uh, like a character that... I I think that's, once again, what makes so much of this work and compelling is that it all feels more layered. We've all seen the psycho, the cold-blooded killer. And then they they, ha- they give us that. We get that character, but then they, they add in this, this other stuff into it that just makes them a little bit more compelling. A little, few more layers thrown into the mix that makes them so fascinating to watch. And when you have like someone that's able to so transform into this creep, it's cool. Now, I will say this. One of the issues that I had with the film is the way it kind of because there's so many characters, because so much is taking place on so many different places, it can feel like there's big chunks where we're not spending time with main characters. And in the case of Bay Rotha, he's not introduced until like halfway through the movie. And since this movie is part two of this whole saga that is Dune, he's not introduced until like three fourths of the way through it. And he's like really important. And he's this possible second candidate. And so I like, I haven't, like I said, I haven't read the book, so I don't know exactly when he's introduced in this other context. It feels from watching the 84 version of the miniseries that he comes into play sooner in other ones. And perhaps the the benefit of that is that by the time they introduce him, walk him down this path to show him as the potential second candidate, put the hand in the box, you really understand it. You know what that means. You you get it. We've been paying attention to the Bene Gesserit and everything, their manipulations. We've seen Paul rising and then we introduce him and we get exactly the implications and importance of this other potential candidate in that moment. But I mean, I think at the same time, I think you could have run these parallels starting earlier in the film too and show each of them as the potential candidate each of them potentially wandering down this path of the Benny Genesis, what they're working towards. But I, th- th- uh, only a few nitpicks with the film, but that spacing out of characters was one that was like, even watching it the second time, like, wow, it really does take a long time before we introduce the guy that in some ways the main physical villain of this film. And he's not introduced till halfway through the movie, despite his whole family being introduced beginning of the last movie. Talk about the Emperor and his daughter and how I felt they were pretty underdeveloped. Second viewing, hold on to that position. And like I said, this is probably going to be my my top three of the year. Could be my number one movie of the year, but that doesn't mean there aren't things where I went, hmm, there's like a little bit more time with this. And I think we, we, we move up just a little bit, give it a little bit better, but the, the, obviously the movie is fantastic as is, but so you have this scenario where you have the emperor with his, he's, he's manipulating the Harkins, Harkins to do something for his purposes, for what he thinks is right. It's revealed. Really? This is all coming from the Bene Gesserit who have manipulated the emperor who's manipulating both Harkonnens, Atreides, all the manipulations kind of going on at the same time. But what we, what, what it doesn't really do much of is help us to understand the galactic politics. We understand the importance of spice and it is like the currency, it is the fuel for the economy and makes things work. So if you control the spice, you control the galaxy. Like we get that, get that. But like you, you get the, imp- you hear like, oh, they've stopped spice production and you like, you know, that's bad but you don't really get a feel for for this up here, this large scale, what they, besides the summarized version, we don't, doesn't feel like we get a, 
I don't get a good vibe of what the emperor is up to or how he, how he fits into this besides being manipulated. What him is where you have these other factions and we understand the layers to them. That's what the layers, what I keep going back to the depth. I don't think feel the movies gave that to the, the emperor. Uh, he's just the guy that is manipulated by these other people as a, a piece in all of this. That's it, He's just a plot point. He's just a tool to be used by other people. He doesn't have his own side to it. But like, especially coming out of the second time viewing it and you, you really realize, of course, it's about Dune, this one planet. And it's about primarily these two houses and the, the emperor. I don't even... I don't even think they mentioned the name of any of the other houses. Maybe there's a line in there, but it's it's like such like a passing thing that we're, we're told the other houses are coming in. The other houses, if they hear about this, but we don't have like any know anything about them. As wonderful and detailed as the world building is for the main characters here, we only have illusions and vague references. There are other houses. There are other worlds. That is this big, gigantic galaxy run by the spice. But we're looking at this, and we have our 20-minute mini-movie on the Harkonnen planet. We have, we're on Caladan for, you know, 10 minutes in the first movie. But the rest of it is on Dune, which it's movie's called Dune, Dune Part 2, so we should be. But... It's that bigger side of things where it felt like we could have had a little bit more time. We a little bit more information to understand Emperor's part in it and what it what is this galactic politics besides Spice runs things and Spice is power. Okay, cool. There's other houses. Who are they? What <laughs> what is that like? Uh some something. I think that's the if there's a thing that was really underdeveloped and I left the second feeling like really wanting that right there feels like we could have had more. That's what comes to mind. And the reason for that, let's talk about some world building here. When you have a movie, you know, a book, of course, too, that does such great world building, it also highlights where you're missing the world building. And that's I mean, to kind of transition over. But because it feels like we have such an understanding of the politics of Dune, the Fremen, Harkonnens, Ar Atreides, we get that. And there's so much detail about what's going on with the different values, the different beliefs, different strategies, different resources in this. Kind of highlights how little we know about everyone else, <laughs> how little we know about anything else, and how thin the galactic building was, since that's not, no longer about world, about galaxy building is, but the world building is so good. <laughs> And just you watch the movie. And as I said earlier, there's not an, a false frame in the film where that comes about through the combination of an immaculate production on technical levels, as well as set design, as well as a great script, as well as performances that all comes down to the, the, the details of the moments that just makes everything feel like it was thought out, that you believe that this is a real place. And when the images look great, you can believe in the image and go, oh, that's real. But then you start playing out the details of everything. And we have Fremen from the North and the South and the prophecies come from the South. So people up North they don't believe in some of the, they don't believe in the stuff immediately. Therefore, they have to be won over while others immediately buy into it. And it's, it's like a detail like that, that like feels so human. There's people over there, not people over here. And these people have different beliefs than these people. They're the same groups in a sense, but different groups form different beliefs and things like, okay, that feels real. Beginning of the movie, we kill a bunch of these Harkonnen stormtroopers and the first thing that happens afterwards is they suck all the water out of them. And as soon as we go into the world of the Fremen, water becomes so important. And you go, right, they live in a desert. They have no bodies of water that we can see anywhere. And so humans are a lot of water. And so immediately they suck the water out of them. And then when stuff starts going down, you see a, a tear going down someone's face. And this little detail where Stilgar walks up, takes a drop off of a face and licks it. Something that 
I would never do. It would be creepy, weird, and gross on so many different levels. But in the world of Fremen, where water is so utterly precious, you see a tear and you go, don't waste that. Or even right before this, when they kill people and uh, uh, Lady Jessica starts getting sick and he's like, keep it, hold it down, hold it down, hold it down. Oh, we just lost all the water in her vomit because she vomited it up. And it's supposed to tell like every moment, any interaction that ties to water in the world of the Fremen matters to such sacred things to them, both in just a normal day to day survival sense, but also in a spiritual sense, as we learn shortly afterwards. And that's when world building is done so right to where you just buy into this group of people as a real people. They're thought out. It's detailed. So then we go in and we see these underground pools of water and we wouldn't drink, dare drink any of this. We'd rather, we'd rather die than drink this because this is our sacred water. You start to realize, like, oh, okay, like, okay, that's interesting. And then later in the movie, when you see the area being bombarded and this temple starts crumbling and rocks start falling into the sacred water, you feel the, the desecration of something sacred. We don't need a ton of details about the, this water because, like, the specifics, why would this water would be sacred? Because we've seen every other way the Fremen deal with water. And then they say, we won't drink that for this reason. And you go, oh, that 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 is so special and sacred to them. And it makes sense because of all the other stuff, all the other moments, the teardrop, the vomit, the sucking water out of the dead immediately makes this sacred water so important and you just need a shot of rocks falling into it while a mount is bombarded for you to go, ooh, ooh, oh no, that's their sacred water. And you feel it. That's, that's world building done right. Done in an interesting uh, fashion. But the, like, the whole thing kind of feels like that. These different planets have their different ways in which they do things and little details in which they do things. And you, you buy into all the small things. Therefore, you buy into all the big things. Today's video is brought to you by Factor. In the last month alone, I went to Florida, then I went to Phoenix, I did some public speaking. I like to eat healthy, but I don't have a lot of time to prep healthy meals. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. You get pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. No prep. No mess, Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. You'll have over 35 options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie plus, and more. There's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. I like their protein smoothies to kick off the day with some protein. It's also flexible for your schedule. You can get as little or as much as you need from six to 18 meals per week, and you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Head to factormeals.com slash Sean Chandler 50 and use code Sean Chandler 50 to get 50% off. That's code Sean Chandler 50 at factormeals.com slash Sean Chandler 50 to get 50% off. The link is down below in the description. The Gideon Prime sequence, the Harkonnen planet, just a very cool sequence, largely because of the way they shot it. And we're in this movie that is so orange and yellow and brown. It's so desert. And it, it, it it's not specifically that the colors are like vibrant. It's just a very distinct color scheme for... Although anytime we're on Dune, it's like a very limited color scheme with popping blue eyes coming from people. And then we cut over to this Harkonnen planet and it's basically black and white and indoors a little bit of red. And it's just such a stark contrast between the people, the culture and the visual style and once you're trying to build out our world building and make us understand these different groups and how they work, what they value, we go to this Harkonnen planet and it just 
everything about their existence here is so unbel like polar opposite different from over on this other planet. And I, I, I guess, I guess Denis Villeneuve, I guess said that the, I haven't read the books once again, but like he had this idea of like a black sun that would give you this monochrome planet. And they decided to shoot it with like infrared cameras to give it this very specific black and white look that it's not just, we filmed it in color and turned, turned the color off, desaturated it, you know, just dropped the filter on it. They shot it with these infrared cameras that gave it a very distinct black and white look that we haven't really, I haven't seen that version of black and white like this before, but combined with the sense of what you're seeing there is because of their sun. And then when people walk indoors and we're getting light from a light, a, a, not a sun from a light source, everything looks different and suddenly some reds enter, enter into things. And you have these people that are like, they're, they're painted white and pale, but you see the, the under red coming through a little bit and what's just like this way that's it's interesting looking. And it's done in both a you know, production technical sense in a very cool, just cool to look at, but also it ties into this world building of buying into this place that is such a different everything that even the way they experience light and color is different from everyone else. And I just, I love the, the fireworks, like the, like I'm not even sure what, you, what we're looking at, but they you know, these fireworks and they explode and it looks like underwater splashes, but it like, you're like, you clearly recognize it as a firework. And then when you would normally see the you know, particles sprinkle down, it's like a slow motion splash in the sky, but three dimensional, but also monochrome. This is so cool. So interesting looking that, I don't know, just that those details are what, I don't know, make the movie so immersive and interesting to look at. And um, I probably don't need to talk too much about d d diving into the production stuff. Talked about it in detail in my, my non-spoiler review. But as I said, there's not a hall of frame in the whole movie. All of it is believable. You buy into the little details. Therefore, you buy into the world. And so much of that comes down to that they did everything. That, or they, the difference between Dune Part 1 and 2 and the recent Marvel projects is that Danny Villeneuve and his crew, they knew what they wanted to make from the beginning. They knew what they wanted to look like and they knew what they needed to do to make it believable. And they're all on the same page to like make that happen. So before action, we know what we're trying to do and we're all committed to doing the hard week to work to pull it off and make every frame believable. And we need worms to look like this. We need this to look like this. And so when you're all on the same page and you have a clear vision at the beginning the whole production from what do we need to do, practice what we need to do, since you know what you're doing early on, is designed. We're all in harmony, unison, working towards the same goal. And with a lot of the Marvel projects, this is well documented. They'll have one group of people over here working on battle sequences while the script isn't even written yet. Then the director comes in with their thoughts. And then they shoot the movie and they won't always know what they want things to look like. That infamously, the, the uh, suits in Endgame, they hadn't decided what they wanted them to look like yet when they filmed. So everyone was in like motion capture suits. Because we'll figure it out down the line. And for their suits, their time travel suits, quantum realm suits, it didn't matter. It, it worked, looked fine. But when you use that same line of thought of like, we'll figure it out in post, we'll figure it out later. And then you go, oh, we changed this. We want to shift this around. And everyone is moving in different directions for different purposes, for different plot points, for different reasons. And you're trying to fix it at the back end. That's where you get kind of this falseness to it. It wasn't filmed at the beginning, knowing the end result. It was filmed early on for the purpose of having the most flexibility and options later on. Denny Villeneuve shot knowing what we were working towards and we're going to get ourselves in trouble if we don't stick to it. So he talks about in interviews, 
yeah, we shot with infrared cameras and I had to warn Warner Brothers, we're committing to this. Like if like it will be in black and white, you cannot add color afterwards. We're we're shooting it to look because we this is what we want. You can't change it. It's not flexible. And on the side with Marvel, they want flexibility on their scripts and their visual effects and plot points, everything. They want flexibility. So they shoot everything for max flexibility in post and we'll fix it in post. We'll finish it in post. That's why they look the way they do. Because you're, you're seeing the first draft of the eighth iteration. Whereas over here, before we went action, a year before we said action, all everybody knew what they wanted. Everybody knew what Denny was working towards and what the production guys said. And I, they all knew at the beginning. So the whole process was trying to fine tune the thing at the beginning rather than leaving flexibility, the whole process to change it. That's the difference. And so Denny Villeneuve came from a background in doing documentaries. And like he, he appreciates nature, the grandness of things. He wants as much to be real in camera as can be. He wants everything to be based on something in reality. And so like with the sandworms, they, they studied the throats of beatboxers. And they saw this motion that was kind of icky and gross, but it had like a, just the gyration of this throat. And they went, that's so interesting looking of this real motion. That is the basis for the throat of the sandworm. And then they're trying to figure like, what would it actually look like? What would it take for a worm to move through the sand like that? And they, they did all of this research, science, diving into things to try and figure out what would that really look like? What would it really take to do that? And then they went, okay, now how do we replicate that with real sand? And CGI is all over this movie, but it all starts with a real thing. It starts with something grounded in reality. So you have all the tools at your disposal that they you know, talk about how you know, they have like a metal plate with sand on top of it and they vibrate the metal plate and it would start sinking and vibrating and stuff like that. And they'd start from that and then the CGI has to build on top of that, but stay in accordance with a real physical phenomena. And that, that's what like all of these details and they did the work before they hit record so that they have something real on set that's all working towards this final product to where a movie that costs under $200 million, it is not a cheap film. But all of these other films cost a lot more and they look much worse. And they filmed this in a very difficult setting. Like there's interviews where Denny Villeneuve is sitting there with James Cameron and James Cameron's like, like, so and the, the, the interesting thing about the conversation uh, that you can look this one up, James Cameron, Denny Villeneuve uh, talking to each other, both of them are in awe of the other person's work for opposite reasons. James Cameron made this immersive pair of films, uh, the Avatar films, that are almost purely in a digital world. Denny Villeneuve can't can't imagine doing that. And then James Cameron is looking at Denny Villeneuve's two-part th production that he just made, like, how on earth did you run a production in a desert? Like, that is such a difficult way to do lighting, such a difficult, that's difficult on the equipment. There's nothing easy about that. But you're talking about like in the world of big spectacle guys, two guys, wildly different approaches to it. The two guys that are kind of the at the moment, you might even say the best at their version of things in awe at the other person's ability to create something immersive using two very different approaches and techniques. But Daniel Villeneuve coming from that background in documentary filmmaking, filming nature wants to be there, be present, have the actors on a set, have them engaging with a real environment, have something in camera that is so real and true that all the CGI can latch onto that and augment the reality, expand the reality, but it's all based and started in a reality. And when you do that, you can create a scenario where a guy surfs on top of a worm and you believe it and you go, yeah, okay. I buy that. But even on that, like there's interviews talking about, oh, we had to do so much research to figure out how would you do that? What would it really take for someone to, to, to make that happen? What's the image of how you get on top of it for the first, like all of that to figure it out. That'll bring us to our final battle and resolutions. And as I said in my spoiler free review, truly massive epic finale, 
with so many different plot points, competing groups and their uh, different goals merging together for this big showdown that is truly epic, but does have a few things that I wish were a little bit longer or fleshed out. So we go into it and they've they've set up a, a series of scenarios to where Paul, having now manipulated the prophecies of the Fremen into leading all of them across the whole planet, are heading in to take on uh, um, the Harkonnens, but he's also challenged the Emperor. So the Emperor feels like he needs to go. So he's falling into the trap and using what Paul knows uh, the, is the ignorance of everyone else of the Fremen to where they think Fremen are a little bit of cave people, not realizing there's a lot of them. Also not realizing that Paul has Gurney. Gurney has access to these nukes, not realizing that the Fremen have these sand, like they dramatically underestimating what's out there. So they kind of fall into it thinking we're secure. We've got our joint armies, fortitude, shields. We're good to go. But Paul is the one that understands both sides and is manipulating both sides and has those visions of the future. So creates this scenario to where our final battle in this movie, as it starts, you have two massively large armies. You have Sandstorm. You have nukes. <laughs> like, it is all in here. You got these orthocopter thing, the firefly ships flying around. It is massive. And I think for that reason, when it starts going down, we charge in, we got battle taking place. And almost immediately, when all of this comes together, we cut to the throne room and you hear knocking on the door and the door opens and Paul walks in. Because everything is so big and so epic, feels shockingly short before we get to like, this is the payoff thing. And maybe that is Denny Villeneuve's way of like, how do you stay true? Every frame has to ring true the way the rest of the film did. And if the whole concept here is it's a, basically a sneak attack. They know it's coming, but because of all these other factors that Emperor and Harkins don't know about, it's essentially a sneak attack. Therefore, Paul gets right in and you have you can't stretch out the battle too much or else all of a sudden the concept of what's happening here, the reason they're able to win the sneak attack doesn't play true. I still think you could have added a little bit more time here or like the chosen way to present it is not let's show Paul surfing on top of a worm. He crashes through a wall. He dismounts. He walks up to the door, kicks in the door and everyone goes, Oh, it plays it in the room. Back to what we talked about before. So much of what makes this film work is the reactions of people. And so you have these powerful people to think the Fremen are no one, Paul is this abomination. What's going And they're just sitting there. The battle starts and they're like, oh crap, what's going on? The room's shaking and they're like terrified. And almost immediately the door kicks in. We're seeing it from their perspective. We're seeing so much of the battle from their perspective and their perspective is not on the front lines. It is not looking out the window. And so you get the dread of them rather than the thrill of watching the action. And so maybe some of it's that, that, but I feel like, look, um, a couple more details of sandworms smashing through walls or something like to like feel that moving towards it, maybe a little bit more cross cutting of inside the, the temple, we feel safe. And then you hear crashes and you see them like, maybe we are in danger. Then you see a sandworm smash through a wall and then you, they hear the sound of that and you see the dread. I, I don't know. I, I just think there could have been a little bit more before we see that door open Paul walk in because it was, it's so epic. It's so big. It's so good that you just, there's not many times where you can see a battle on that scale. And it's like, this looks fantastic. This is so cool. Wish we kind of got a little bit more of it. And the way the battle plays out, the, the final battle is final battles. We have the first charge. We have the battle of the, of Paul in the room with the people. That's more who's really in charge here. You, you have then some nighttime shots of ships. You have Gurney. 
in uh, Drax the Destroyer, our Thanos Drax rematch. You have the knife fight. Like, you have all of these. And so the final battle sequence in the movie is not short. But the biggest battle part is short. And I think that's the piece that makes it feel like, well, we, that's all we got. The biggest piece is the smallest piece, kind of. Well, I guess some of those other ones are pretty short, too. But like this, when you have something this big, you feel like it probably should be a little bit longer. Or at least I felt that way. But so we're in the throne room. And once again, so much of what makes it satisfying, Paul walks into the room. He's not the little kid from the beginning of the movie anymore. Quiet, unsure of himself, walks in without pausing, stabs someone in the neck. Flip back to our previous movie. One of the last things that he does in the last movie is kill someone. And he's desperately trying not to kill this guy that he hasn't really met before. He's been in his dreams, but he hasn't met him before. And he doesn't want to kill him. He wants the guy to just yield, but he has to kill him as part of the ways. And so he hesitates for a long time to kill this person. Get to this movie, this journey that he's been on, how much he's changed. He walks in and without pausing or thinking about it, walks up to grandpa. Hey, grandpa kills him and doesn't just kill him, kills him in like in a way that's intended to be degrading. It's like, we're going to throw you out to the ants or to the desert with the ants to get you without pausing. And all the ways that he doubted himself in all these other contexts, he's so confident talking to the most powerful people in the galaxy. No hesitation. Pure confidence. And I think like some of that is how the movie has these multiple layers of we know the negative that can come from all of this. But there's something about watching that journey of rising to power and all that he did had to go through to get to this moment. And it has that payoff of, we're not sure that Paul is, a, is necessarily the hero here, but we know they're bad. And whether Harkonnens, emperors that betrayed the Atreides and tried to wipe out the whole family line or the manipulators behind the whole thing. We view them as worse than him. There are worse things that can happen because of him, but as an individual person in this moment, he's more noble than they are. They had this coming. They they pushed and he's pushing back in a big way. So then we kind of, we, we're going to get the nighttime sequence of them shooting a little bit more battle. Once again, wish we got a little bit more of that because it just looks cool. All leading up to a, one of the other big ones that I thought was underdeveloped, but... You have Gurney, and his his place in this story is essentially he's the the truest um, continuation of Leto's Trades dynasty or people. Paul has his his own motivations to avenge his father and his family, things like that. But he's also tied to the Fremen, and there's 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 all of these complications to everything that he's doing. Whereas Gurney is still in the exact same mode that he was in before, that his purpose was to protect his duke and his friend and his friends. And these Harkonnens come in and wipe them out. And so then when he realizes Paul is alive, his loyalty is now to Paul. And he realized Paul is not the little boy anymore. He is a powerful leader and someone worth following. Once again, like watching through the movie, you have all these sequences where, you know, he doesn't believe in these prophecies and everything, but you have these moments where Paul does things and you see this non-believer get converted over in his own way to following this boy that at the beginning of the movie, he, you know, he's trained or beginning of the first other movie, he's training and guiding father figure, mentor figure. And now he just looks up to him as this great, like, leader of this planet and just so, how much this movie's reactions um, is, is is cool stuff and that's the important like when you have your Denny Villeneuve you can get all the best actors in the world to want to be in your movie <laughs> for whatever part works really nicely but what do I, where, where all this is headed Gurney is the most um, pure version of avenging Leto 
just, it d- removes all that other stuff from it. He has one goal. You hurt my friends, my Duke. I'm going to get you. And so you have this moment where they, they make it between Drax the Destroyer and Thanos. And it like it's that's it. Like that's the whole fight. We're about to do our epic duel for the ages that people, you know, it's it's going to be one of the fights people talking about, you know, probably MTV Music Awards 2025. This is going to win best fight of the year with uh, our you know, Paul's final fight. So you, you, you can't do two epic fights for the ages. You don't want to get repetitious. So you don't want to overdo it. But as Gurney is our purest Avenger of the Atreides of Leto, in this moment, you want a little bit more there. And part of the appeal is that this guy, this shrieking Harkonnen, just yelling all the time, very dangerous guy, making the... And we saw him earlier in the movie, run in fear, run from it. Like, he's he's all shout, but he does... Like, there's a side to it that making the point, he's nothing outside of his relationships because of his last name. That's the only reason that he has power. And so Gurney just takes it. There's a side to that. The, the swiftness of it is profound and powerful. But as something that has large emotional ramifications for the broader story, it's awfully swift. It's very quick. And it, you know, it's you, know, you get your final line, you know, for my Duke and my friends. Like, you, it has everything. In, like, the, you don't need more dialogue. You don't need, but some way to just pause on it a little bit more. Something because it just felt so brief for something that felt really important to me. So then this leads into final section. Paul has decided he wants to be emperor. He's going to take charge. And so it walks in, says, hey, I got a plan. I'll marry your daughter. Back to our reactions or everything here. And we got Zendaya right over there. Um, stand right over there. His his actual, the person he actually loves and that loves him, that in the, this moment kind of knows him the best and understands everything the best. And he's told her, no matter what, I will love you till the day I die. He promised her, I'll be with you till I die. And then now he's become the person that uh, prophecies, resp- all, of, all of the other stuff comes first before love. It's kind of this, like that's all that stuff from his mother that there's something more important than love. And, you know, his father early said, I, I should have married you. And because his priority was was love. He actually is a more noble person. It's not all about, you know, game of dunes. It's not all about the power and all of that. It's a truer person. Paul, taken more after his mother, more about the politics, the power, all of that. As much as he does love her over there, he's, I need to marry this one so that I get the seat and we'll rule together. And we see the look on Zendaya's face. And they, they've done this all throughout pretty much the whole movie where they use her as almost the counterbalance to everyone else. Everyone else is being won over. Everyone else is being convinced from her friend, to, of, co- of course, Stilgar. But you know, Gurney even comes in. These moments with you know Gurney, not a believer in their customs, these prophecies, not one of their people, but he's being convinced. And she is more and more seeing him get drawn away to this very dangerous version of himself. I've said a million times, I haven't read the book. I have read a number of article, interviews and things like that where they're describing some of the differences between the two things. And they intentionally made her more of a skeptic in this as a way to allude to what happens in future books to like, she's that person that is trying to set up the dread and fear of the future. She's representing what more people should be feeling in this moment. And all throughout the movie, she doesn't have to say anything. Her face says it all. The betrayal, the hurt, the fear, the dread, the sense of loss. Her face says it. She doesn't have to say many words. The expressions do it all. Dialogueless acting. There's been a bunch of things, quotes from a, um, 
or I made just one quote from Denny Villeneuve where he talks about, I don't really like dialogue. That's like for television and the theater. Movies are about images, which is an interesting perspective on on film. But you watch this movie with that quote in mind. I've gone back to it many, many times, but think how many times in this film the important thing is the reactions. That that drives so much of what's happening is the reactions on people's faces. And that's what gives it the emotion, the significance. It's not what they say. It's how they react. It's interesting. But we kind of we go into this and um, Paul wants the throne. Give me the throne. Uh, you can stand up. You can get your fighter. And of course, he picks Austin Butler. Then Gurney's like, let me fight for you. Don't blood this monster, this animal. Don't let me do it. Like, Paul, no, no, I have to do this. It has to be me. And so you have this fight. Very cool fight. Um, and just even the way it looks kind of like that. Back to our world building. Back to all these little details where the the nature of their technology and with their shields has the the fast things don't penetrate it. You have to slowly penetrate the shields, which creates a scenario where they're creating these, these um, different fighting style for the different purposes where it's, it's not just about the fastest attacks. It's about the sneakiest attacks that sneak in and get in all that stuff. And so the fights just have a, there's a different vibe to the choreography because they're not doing what, we would do in a knife fight. I wouldn't be in a knife fight, but the way that we design knife fights aren't around these shields technologies, penetrating these shields and everything like that. And once again, mirroring the beginnings where we have that fight early on in the first movie where Paul thinks he's won, but he hasn't. It's a little knife gotcha. And then we get into this fight where for a, it looks like Paul's losing. He's been stabbed. He's in worse shape, but he's a pure conviction. And he's even allowing the fact that he looks weak, provide that moment where he gets that secret jab in where we think maybe he's going to lose. And then he's the one standing at the end triumphant. So cool fight. And even on like a story and character level ties back to things set up earlier, like c going back to the, the difference between some of that when Marvel does some stuff and the way that Dune, this movie was made. Uh, if you know my channel, I built this channel on Marvel. I, I'm, I'm picking on them because they have had such great fame and I want them to get back to that great success. But if your whole movie is changing constantly and you're rewriting it and you're changing it in post, everything's moving, everything's in flux, nothing is locked. It's really difficult to set up all of these little parallels, all of these little mirrors, all these little moments that have one meaning at the beginning and a different meaning at the end. But if you start with the end in mind, before you hit record, you know where you're ending. And we're all on the same page of how we want all of this to look and how it's all going to work. When you do that properly, all of a sudden, you see all these parallels, all of these little payoffs of things we were taught at the beginning of the first movie that finally pay off at the end of the second movie. And you you start piecing it together and weaving it together so it all feels cohesive and meaningful. Properly set up, properly developed, properly paid off. And that's what this movie does so well to where just this little knife fight, the reason is tension is is because our hero's getting stabbed, but also they set up early on this little trick that he was taught, this little, th how do you win? Like this thing, we saw him learn that. We're not thinking about it in the moment by the time we get here. But the way that he wins all of this goes back to one of the very first scenes in, in all, of, all of these two movies, um, all culminating in him being victorious. And so then we, so that'll bring us to our epilogue where Emperor really doesn't want to surrender control, but eventually he's like, I, I guess I have lost. I have lost. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to die if I don't do this. So he yields. Um, Paul tells Gurney to message to all the houses. We'll blow up the spice if you don't listen to our demands. Uh, daughter says, I'll marry you. I'll be submissive. Just don't kill my dad. And 
you uh, uh, have this line that's really important that uh, where they say that the, the other houses have refused to accept your, your claim to the throne or whatever the line of dialogue was. They re- rejected your ascendancy. And then you have a later on line where Lady Jessica looks at all this and she goes, oh, the holy war, the jihad has begun. And it's fascinating because um, in so many regards, this is the completion of the first book, completes the story of all of this. And just a couple of lines of dialogue makes the whole thing feel like this massive cliffhanger that's open. And even you know, like my buddy Cody Leach said, I don't know if I'd known that this was only part two and there's going to be another one, then I probably would have better expectations going into it the first time. And once I realized they're planning on doing a third one, um, and like I, I get what he's saying there, but um, because it, like you get to the end of it and it, it immediately creates new dangling threads. And of course there's a zillion Dune books and then continues all of this, but the movie finishes its story and intentionally creates that open loop. It intentionally creates that um, unanswered questions in our mind of like, oh, what happens next? Like uh, this, you know, this is what I would say is like cliffhanger done right, where first movie, it's part one of two. So it ends on like what's going to happen, but it doesn't really resolve anything. This resolves all of our main plot threads but opens new ones. Or as I said in my spoiler-free review, the whole thing's been about getting to this destination. We get there, and then it goes, but here's where it's next. And you go, okay, it's, we do have resolution, but we also have more dangling threads out there that, we, that we're working towards. But uh, in the, once again, we see everyone's reactions to this, where the Fremen, they believe their Messiah has arrived, the chosen one has arrived that will lead them to paradise. When actually, maybe other things are about to happen. And then it ends on Zendaya heading off into the desert, having had her loved one not only choose the darker path, choosing a different woman. And it clo- of all the images to close on, it's her heading off on her own. Interesting. And once again... We don't need dialogue. We don't need uh, to explain what that means. We know what that means because it was properly set up and built out over the course of this entire film. This we had this love story that ends with him off over here and the multiple journeys inside of Paul, which is rising up as the filler of a prophecy Rise her up as filling up this manipulative plan to control the galaxy, his love story, his own journey of his own shifting goals and value sets leads to this moment. And the person that in this movie he's closest with is the one off on her own, heading away from all of it. Communicates so much. There's my spoiler packed thoughts on Dune part two and how I interpreted the film probably had some mistakes in there as someone that hasn't read the book. And I'm sure in the comments, many of you will correct the places where I got the mythology wrong in all of that or had a misread of the moment. But I think that's what makes it so interesting. It's so dense. You can watch it and have a very wrong interpretation for very reasonable reasons. Um, so anyway, let me know your thoughts down below. Don't spoil future want books without future movies, without spoiler warnings, but spoil away for the actual movies that we have seen. If you want to get that free audiobook, it's audibletrial.com slash Sean Chandler. Link is down below in the description or those meals delivered directly to your door. The link is down below, below in the description to get factor. Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.